Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I praise Allah Azza wa Jal, Creator of the heavens and the earth, and I send peace and blessings to all of the prophets from the beginning of time. And I begin with the greeting words of the righteous: Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was the last of a long series of prophets and messengers. They came to their people with the belief in one God. And it is reported that after the final sermon, the Arafat sermon, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sent his followers in all directions. He sent them not to militarily conquer the world, but merely to spread the message to all those who were absent. But at the same time, the Muslims were being surrounded by world powers. And books of history show us that on the eastern side, the Persian Empire, the Sassanid dynasty, attacked the Muslims and the young fledgling nation responded and overthrew the Sassanid dynasty. From the north came the powerful Byzantine Romans. They attacked the Muslims from their northern borders and the young Islamic state responded and they were able to defeat the Roman Empire. Muslims were merely responding to the attack that had come to them from different angles. Islam was a religion of peace, but at the same time a religion of justice. And so therefore Muslims responded to defend themselves and also for the right to spread their message throughout this planet. It is reported in 642 AD that a small force of uh, believers entered into Egypt under the leadership of Amr ibn al-As radiallahu an, and they were able to overthrow an unpopular uh, Byzantine Roman leadership with popular support. The people of Egypt defended the Muslims and opened up the way for them everywhere they went. And from Egypt, they continued on to the west until it is reported that they even reached as far as the Atlantic Ocean. And one of the famous uh, Sahaba named Uqba ibn Nafi'a radiallahu an is reported to have reached the Atlantic and to say that um, if I knew there was land across you, I would take this message for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uqba established a base that they call Qirawan. And this became a central point for the Muslims in the area of Tunis. It was a place where they were able to uh, take in traffic coming from the east to deal with the people of the west, to set up a port for the Mediterranean Sea, and also to get a, a view and an opening to the Sea of Sand to the south. By the year 705, Islam was spreading across this region, not based upon these military confrontations. What was happening was a natural relationship where, as a result of migration, people migrating after the conquests, also trade and the wandering of scholars and mystics. Because of this, Islam was able to naturally spread and people who were not Muslims were able to come in contact with the Arabic language and with the teachings of the Creator of the heavens and the earth. And so Arabic, in a sense, became a lingua franca. It became a common language spoken by uh, non-Arabic speaking people and used as a language for commerce, um, for science, uh, and for communications. In 711, it is reported uh, that the leader of the Muslims in North Africa, Musa bin Nusayr radiallahu an, responded to a call that came from believers in one God, from Unitarian Christians who were living across the straits um, of the Mediterranean. They were living in what was known as the Iberian Peninsula. And so in responding to the Jews and to the Unitarian Christians, Musa bin Nusayr sent 
his uh, leading general, Tariq ibn Ziyad, rahimahullah, who went across the straits, who landed on a mountain, and they called it Jebel Tariq. And so Jebel Tariq is now today Gibraltar. He landed on this mountain, and with a small force of approximately 17,000 Muslims, he faced the army of the Visigoths. It is reported that Roderick, the king of the Visigoths, brought an army of over 100,000 warriors to meet the Muslims on these, on these plains. But through the help of the creator of the heavens and the earth, and through the justice that the Muslims were defending, they were able to defeat Roderick and to continue into what is now known as Spain and Portugal. By the year 755, this area that became known as Al-Andalus was visited by Abdurrahman al-Saqqar, who was one of the leaders of the Umayyad dynasty, who had escaped the major confrontations of the East. He landed in Al-Andalus and he was chosen by the people to be Amir al-Mu'minin. He established a city called Qurtaba. And it was in this city that he established the capital of the state of Islam in Spain, Portugal, and all of that region. This uh, area was known as a center point religiously and in terms of civilization. Cordoba had been uh, a major base for the belief in Christianity. And it is reported that the Muslims purchased the land of the cathedral and they built a very beautiful masjid. That house of worship was considered to be the largest mosque or the largest house of worship in the whole of Europe at the time. Aqueducts were built in order to bring in uh, water. And the city developed significantly till the point where by the year 1000, Cordoba or Cordoba was the largest city on earth. The water was flowing in the streets. The city became known for its fame and for its importance. Historian tells, historians tell us that at its height, Cordoba had approximately 200,000 houses. 600 mosques, 900 public baths, 50 hospitals, and we find huge markets, and, and we find in some of the trade unions, for instance, with the weavers who were weaving uh, cloth alone, there were over 15,000 weavers in Cordoba at that time alone. It also became known for its beautiful Jamiat Mosque, whose architecture uh, is still copied today in many of the mosques and centers throughout the planet. What was interesting about this city is that as Europe and many parts of the world lay in darkness, Cordoba was a, a lighted city. For 10 miles you could walk in any direction in lighted streets. Running water was moving throughout the city. And knowledge was so important that the, that the Khalifa, the Caliph, Hakam II, who ruled from 961 to 976, had a private library of over 400,000 books. The following is a letter from King George II of England to Hisham III, who ruled from 1027 to 1031. He was seeking permission for an English princess to study in Cordoba. The letter goes as follows. From George II, King of England, Gaul, Sweden, and Norway, to the Caliph of the Muslims of the Kingdom of Spain, His Majesty Hisham III, we have been advised that science, knowledge, technology, and industry are far advanced in your country. Therefore, we wish to take the opportunity for our youth to benefit from your achievements as our country 
lacks in these facilities and is in total darkness. We hope this opportunity will give us the chance to follow in your footsteps to illuminate our people with knowledge. My niece, Princess Dobant, and a group of noble English girls seek the favor of your academic staff with the honor of your favor to bestow upon us the opportunity to achieve our goal. The young princess is carrying a gift to your majesty. Your acceptance will honor us. Your obedient servant, George II. This is an example of the level and the heights that Muslims had reached in this part of the world. A recent study was done in the year uh, 2000 on the occasion of the millennium, and it looked at the world in the year 1000 AD. It was interesting to note that there were only 280 million people on earth at that time. But what is astonishing about this period from this study done by a leading magazine in the world, it showed the top 10 cities in the world. One, Cordoba, the largest city on earth in the year 1000. Two, Kaifeng, in part of Sung China. Three, Constantinople, in Byzantium. Four, Angkor, Cambodia. Five, Kyoto, Japan. But six was Cairo, in Fatimid, Egypt. Seven, Baghdad. Eight, Naysapur, in present-day Iran. Nine, al Hassa in present-day Arabia. And ten, Isfahan, in present-day Persia. So out of ten leading cities, six of them were Islamic capitals. This showed the extent of Islamic power and authority in this time. Muslims were making great achievements and having a profound influence upon people throughout the planet. And people would send their children. They would go to the universities of Islam, not only in Al-Andalus, but also in North Africa, in Qairawan, in Cairo, in Baghdad, anywhere in the Muslim world to gain an education. They would treasure learning the Arabic language in the same way that people go to the great universities in London, in Paris, in the United States, in order to raise their academic level. And so, Muslims played a powerful role uh, in this planet, and these cities went down in history as some of the major areas of achievement. I leave you with these thoughts, and we'll take a break for a few moments and come back to the glory of Al-Andalus. خيركم من تعلم القرآن وعلمه ورتل القرآن ترتيله Learning how to recite the Quran properly Learning the meaning of what we recite Concluding the ahkam from the verses which we recite Trying to implement what we learn in our daily life. We we'll listen to the participants and the guests. We'll take your phone calls. We're going to recite life. We'll listen to your recitation. And we'll correct it according to the rules and regulations which we'll state in each episode. Now, your dream will come true. <laughs>